Go ahead, you're live. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, this is John Florescu. I'm in Bucharest in Romania. Now, our two guests are uh, in, I think, one in Washington, you, uh, Yulia Joja and General Philip Ridlove in, are uh, you in Georgia? You're muted. <laughs> okay, uh, I, 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 let me just uh, introduce, introduce them both. Uh, General Philip Reedlove is a Allied four-star general, Allied commander. He was head of NATO from 2013 to 2016. He played top military roles in Korea, obviously South Korea. In effect, he was uh, played a key role in the, during the Cold War, during the Gulf War, and also in Afghanistan. And Professor Yulia Sabine Joja is director of the Frontier Europe Initiative in Washington. She has a postdoctoral degree from John Hopkins, nearby John Hopkins University, and a master's, I think, from King's College London. And she has a particular expertise, among other things, in Black Sea security. And I welcome you both, and I thank you both for being here. We uh, um, may have a little bit of def difficulty with the general because he's, he's winging it with his cell phone, but so far it looks very good. General, I want to start with you. Um, in 2014 on CNN, you spoke about the dangers of Russian expansionism. The next year at the Atlantic Council, you warned of revanchism from Russia. And in 2016, you said, quote, the US must rebuild Europe to face a more aggressive Russia. Do you ever feel I told you so? Well, clearly events have played out in a way that we were describing in 2014. Um, when we saw Russia use its land forces to cross internationally recognized borders and invade a neighbor. And we uh, also, at the time, made the largest changes to NATO's readiness and force structures in the history of NATO. Since that time, NATO has taken further steps, I'm very, very proud to say. But it was very clear to us at the time that we had a Russia that was not interested in uh, incorporating itself. Incorporating itself? We had been seeking since the fall of the wall. And because we were seeking that, we in the West had taken a bit of a holiday on, on preparing for uh, these kinds of problems in Europe. And Russia, I think, clearly rang the bell that said, we need to now pay attention. And so, yes, we are finding out even more today that Russia is, has designs uh, on rebuilding a, a European security architecture, very reminiscent of the Soviet Union Warsaw Pact days. And we have some ways to go yet to be prepared for that. Um, I want you to. I want to wind back to a uh, professor Mish, Mishimer, who's always being quoted here and there. I see him from time to time at the University of Chicago, and I asked both of you to weigh in on it. But he was making the point in 2014. I think it was at the time when they met here in Bucharest. NATO had a meeting in Bucharest, where they said that um, that they would not. I think it was Ukraine and Georgia would not be invited into NATO, but they kind of kept the door open. And his point was that uh, his mission, the professor's point, was that somehow we were provoking them or we, we got our own just desserts. What do you think of that point of view? Julia? Well, I, I would see it the other way around. I would see it, and I think it's pretty clear at this point that if at the NATO summit in Bucharest in 2008, we would have granted Ukraine and Georgia, we would have overcome the French and the German veto and would have granted them a clear path to membership with a membership action plan. These aggressions against Georgia in 2008 and against um, Ukraine since 2014 and now renewed at a, such an ample scale would have been prevented. Um, and we see this pattern 
um, in terms of force ratio and force perception um, now with NATO. Um, at the beginning of this year in January, um, Putin had asked President Biden to um, stop NATO um, uh, integration and um, stop NATO expansion and actually withdraw membership um, from all countries that have joined after 1997. And now we have Finland and Sweden joining, which is a fantastic, um, a fantastic uh, power enforcement for NATO. And Putin is saying nothing. Um, he was bluffing just like he does um, with, with a lot of things because he, we see also now in this war that Russia stands no chance against, um, against NATO. So um, if we are to look back at the mistakes that we've made, the mistake was probably, at least in my opinion, and I think many share this, um, that, uh, that we did not grant membership action plan to Georgia and Ukraine. And now they're bearing the cost for that. Right, General, would you add anything to that? Yes, I, I think I completely agree with Dr. Joja on these, on how she laid it out. So let me just attack one other thing that was in your question. And you were talking about that we should be, con or the, the author that you discussed said we should be concerned about provoking Russia. And this is one of my least favorite uh, uh, phrases and one that I love to talk to, so I'll try to force myself to be short. And here's the short answer. When are we going to be provoked? Russia has used its land army in 08 and seized a part of a neighbor. Russia has used its land army in 13. Russia has now in 2022, uh, aligned its forces and invaded a neighbor to take more of Ukraine. And so the question I ask people is, why are we worried about provoking Mr. Putin? He is taking actions in a completely undeterred manner. I ask, when are we going to be provoked? I, that's an interesting point. I think Mitt Romney said something about that a few months ago. He said, we're always worrying about what uh, Mr. Putin's going to do, whether we're going to get him, whether we're going to piss him off. Maybe he should think about whether he's going to piss, up off, piss us off. That's a little bit of a comment he said. Let me go around to Davis. I'll go back to Davis to Kissinger. When he was making this point uh, in May, I think it was, where he said that Russia is really part of Europe, historically speaking, part of Europe. They've been on our side in World War II. They suffered greatly. What, 12 million have died. And that, um, that to, to sort of get them out of the European world is to invite them into, in, invite Europe into a, a world of instability. Now you could argue both ways. Of course, Russian history is closely tied last three, 400 years into Europe. But what do you make of Kissinger's comments, both of you? General, you wanna go first? I'll go first because you'll have much better things to say here. First of all, first of all, uh, complete respect for Dr. Kissinger and the, his body of work and his, his, um, his approach to the world. Uh, and so uh, nothing I'm about to say is a criticism, but may I just say that I have a different viewpoint. Yeah. And Dr. Kissinger is um, very much a statesman and a scholar. And, and I think Are, are, and, uh, I, and, and I think you got cut off a sec. And I think pick it up from there. Yeah. So he, I think he's very much a statesman and a scholar, and yeah. and this is the framework in which he thinks. I approach this problem from the viewpoint of a military, yeah. trying to provide hard power security. Uh, first for my country and then secondarily as a part of an alliance, which I started serving in in 1983 as a captain on the inner German border. And so um, my viewpoint of Russia is very pragmatic. As I said in my little diatribe before, just in this, in the 20th, in our current century, in 08, in 14, and now in 22, he has used his army to invade a neighbor. And I 
proclivity. Uh, and if to, you remember, to invade a neighbor, you said to invade a neighbor and I pick it up from there and I. And, and if you now look at the two documents that Mr. Putin gave us, the uh, draft uh, treaties uh, for a better, yeah. lack of a better description. If you read those two treaties, they lay out Mr. Putin's mind and where he is headed. Yeah. And, and that is a, a complete reorganization of the security infrastructure of Eastern Europe. And we have to practically prepare for those kinds of thoughts. Uh, yeah. um, I, again, I agree completely with, with General Breedlove, but I'll offer maybe some additional perspective historically from the point of view of Central and Eastern Europeans. At the end of World War II, indeed, the Soviet Union had helped um, allies uh, win the war against, um, against Nazi Germany, but that has also meant that um, a number of countries and a number of nations now totaling, if we're not counting the Caucasus, but just Central and Eastern Europe, 150 million people, more than Russians, forcefully behind the Iron Curtain. And invasions occurred throughout these years into Eastern Germany, into Hungary, into Czechoslovakia, and the fear of those as in the case of Romania, um, the whole defense, even under communism, was targeted at a possible attack from the Soviet Union, not from the United States or the West. Right. And so this is the 20th century and mistakes were made and compromises were made. But now we're in the 21st century um, in which we have to give, as um, President Biden was very clear with at the when when um, Putin came with those so-called draft treaties that General Britov was referring to, um, his attitude was, I cannot take away power, agency, sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the will to join NATO or not away from Ukraine or from other countries back to the request to, of, of 1997. What Putin is demanding right now is very 20th century that Russia should have a right to dominate and to subjugate um, parts of Central and Eastern Europe, independent of their, again, sovereignty, territorial integrity. But that's not possible anymore. And these people in these countries don't want to be part of it. So I think right now we're actually in a position that many people, independent of age and of experience, um, because I do see parallels, for instance, in the thinking between Henry Kissinger and Emmanuel Macron, a completely different generation, the old thinking that Russia or in Germany for a long time, that Russia must be part of European security. But I think now in July, 2022, we have to start wrapping our heads around the fact if we haven't already done so, that Russia as is right now cannot have any word in European security because this would come to the detriment and against the will of Europeans. I mean, the, uh, I wanna go back generally to what you said about looking at this as a military man, but I also remember the Kissinger in May said that it, we ought to get to the peace table in two months. If we don't get to the peace table in two months, Russia would seek out new, new alliances, which it sort of seems like it's going in that direction, a bit early to say. But do you think that's the case, either one of you, that Russia is now seeking a new triangular alliance with the third world, with China, and with part of Africa? Is that what's in play now? Because at least we didn't get to the peace table soon enough? Either one of you. Uh, General, you're muted. General, you're, you're on. I very much agree that uh, Mr. Putin is seeking out um, other alliances and other people. In fact, in a very uh, concrete sense, he is running out of skilled manpower in his invasion force. And at the very grassroots level, he's looking for soldiers to put into the maw. Um, even if they're untrained. So yes, he's reaching out. And, and again, I will approach this from the practical point and may, maybe Dr. Joja can hit the other side, but the, the fact of the matter is Mr. Putin's uh, attack into Ukraine 
has run into, as we all understand, considerable challenges. And uh, they have underperformed in some major ways uh, as a military. And I think that Russia will want to get to the peace table as soon as they can try to sue for peace by keeping the land that they have gained in this latest uh, illegal, immoral, and inhumane war of this year. And so uh, my counsel or my thoughts are, uh, we should maybe not rush to the peace table because we want to be able to allow Ukraine to set the terms or be a major part of setting the terms of the next peace rather than accepting what Russia hands them uh, at the table. Susan, uh, 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 Julia, Julia, do you want to add to anything there? Um, I don't know if there's a lot to add. I think it's, it's clear, just like it's to be expected, that Russia is seeking alliances. We've seen um, we've seen Russia just over the last few days um, in Iran, um, now doing Mr. Lavrov, foreign minister, is doing a tour of Africa right now mm -hmm. and is making statements exactly in the vein that I think you were asking or alluding to, um, that, um, that these long-term, long-standing allies and dependence of, um, of Russia when it comes to, for instance, grain exports and, and um, other similar things um, will, should, um, should stay away from um, from the West. Um, but as we're looking right now, and as we've seen through the UN General Assembly votes um, in uh, uh, um, condemning a few months ago um, the Russian invasion, we're looking right now, I think, at a world um, that is pretty split. Um, the West is slimmer than um, we would have hoped for, but nevertheless, it's um, in economic terms, um, if you're looking at G7 um, or the European Union or NATO or its allies, um, um, such as South Korea or Japan or Australia, very strong, but less countries than we would have hoped for. Nevertheless, um, a lot of countries that have tried to stay neutral have made their statements um, through the UN General Assembly. And then we have those that vetoed um, and or, or um, voted against that are Russia's allies that are pretty slim. The complicated relationship that I think here in the United States we are worrying about um, is the relationship with China. And, um, and there so far, I think it's too early to call. We've seen warnings from the United States that China should not um, uh, circumvent um, sanctions. But we've also seen um, just in the first few months of war this year um, that China, because of the economic relationship that it has with the United States and the West, is generally avoiding amplifying its support uh, for Russia. So pressure will probably continue to stay on, but it is crucial, particularly in places like Africa, when we think that when we think about the future of warfare and right now the issues that we have with ships, with rare minerals, um, all these things, it is a fight for resources. And China hasn't found its place yet. So we have, I think, a big neutral block that is still pretty undefined. We have a clear solidarity in the West and then Russia has some allies, but then there's the usual suspects, Iran, Syria, yeah. countries like that. General, yeah. I think you wanted to add something. Oh. No, I, I certainly didn't want to interrupt you, but but may I just say that China is an interesting study, and and at the at a very basic level, as I look at it, um, uh, I think that performance of the Russian military, and that kind of uh, maybe gives them pause, uh, since so much of their technology and other things are from with and by Russia. Uh, I think that China certainly uh, has, uh, as we see now, some issues with its own economy and does not want to face the kind of sanctions that Russia has faced because that would exacerbate the problem. And if you begin to separate the ruling group in China from the people, that never has went well for the leaders of China. 
But what I do worry about is that China and for that matter, North Korea and Iran have seen how badly uh, we in the West have been deterred by Mr. Putin's threats of nuclear exchange. You, you, man is very you said, you said, sorry, you got interrupted by nuclear exchange and then? So uh, I think that um, what worries me is that China is watching how uh, we have been deterred by yeah. Russia's threats of tactical nuclear exchange and uh, World War III, if you, if however you describe that. Yeah. And so I think one of the things that we in the West need to deal with in the near future is how to become less deterred and how to uh, reassert some of our own conventional deterrence uh, on Russia um, uh, in order to, to get out from under the what China, North Korea, and Iran are, are yeah. observing. Yeah. What, you were, what you're saying reminds me a little bit of what Wesley Clark said about two and a half months ago when he, he sort of said, this is our moment to step up the game. And um, as a military man, you're both head of NATO, you must be on the same page on that, that we didn't move quick enough. The West did not move quick enough when it had an opportunity. And I remember Wesley Clark going on, going on and, and making that point emphatically. Yes, Wes and I talk almost daily and we work together and have done several events together. And we are pretty much in violent agreement across these issues. Um, and, and one of the things, if I may, just yeah. for a second, for, for those of us who study uh, warfare, we study what we jokingly call the old dead guys, the Clausewitz, the Sun Tzu's, the Jomanese uh, yeah. of history. And they don't say them in exactly these words, but their axioms tell us that we should deter our enemy and not allow our enemy to deter us. And they also, also say that we should seek and see reactive to that we should that, that we should seek and see seek and seize and hold the initiative and not allow ourselves to be reactive to our enemy Do if you think we a failure of nerve something of a failure of nerve in our leadership that's sort of a bit too much on the pause button well we are certainly deterred in a great way yeah. and we need to climb out from under that deterrence and we need to begin to deter our opponent. And we, before the war even started, we ceded the initiative to the enemy. We yeah. said over and over, if you do this, we're going to do this. That is. You remind, you, you remind me of a, co a comment that was made recently. The U.S. gave $2.4 billion in weapons now. Germany, $290 million. France, $160 million. And someone was saying that it's just enough to survive, not enough to regain territory. In other words, uh, so almost like a fear to offend. Is that sort of at the base of it? Well, I, I'm not going to put words in our leaders' mouths. I will only say what I observe. Yep. And that is we are incredibly reticent to take actions that just absolutely make sense. For instance... We keep having a conversation about not giving Ukraine offensive weapons. Yeah. Ukraine is in an existential fight to defend their nation. They are the offended party and the enemy is the offender. Ukraine, by definition, is on defense. And this, this whole discussion about offensive weapons is specious in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, Ukraine, we're telling them you cannot fire into uh, Ukraine. You 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 can't fire into then you can go last year. Yeah, so Ukraine is being told we're not going to give you weapons to fire into Russia, but Russia is firing into Ukraine from all sides: Belarus, yeah. Russia, inside Ukraine, Crimea, the Black Sea firing from all quadrants, but we tell Ukraine, you cannot return fire. This is. Yeah. 
Uh, if I can, Julia, uh, maybe you want to, you, uh, Julia might have step in, and you might want to refer to the attempt by the polls to get the Western nations to allow planes being used or jets being used, if you remember a few months ago, and that was sort of fell off the table at, at, at a time. I guess they were with former Warsaw uh, era uh, planes. Yeah, uh, that's uh, thank you for bringing that up. And um, I can look in a minute after I finish um, speaking and think to an um, article that I published on Friday evening um, about that specifically looking at a potential second front opening in the west of Ukraine as Putin gets under pressure, but we can talk about that separately. Uh, what, what I think fits here really well um, as an example is this deterrence that General Breedlove talks about is also, um, we've seen the United States and the West generally, but the United States as a leader in this un incontestably, and without them, I have to pause here, the conflict would look very different right now. Uh, we would not have a free Kiev. This would not have been possible without the United States support. But in rhetoric, we have been talking too much about the things that we will not do and too little about the things that we will do. Um, in, uh, and this has been, I think the general explained it pretty well, this has been informed by our fear of uh, nuclear escalation that, by the way, is an old Russian habit, a nuclear um, blackmail that we've seen since the Cuban crisis. Um, it's not something that they've invented now. So we, we kind of lost a bit of, um, of uh, expertise um, from the Cold War, unfortunately, yeah. through the generations. Um, but this very pattern we've seen in this war, in the context of offensive-defensive debates, um, at the beginning, we were wondering if javelins with up to five kilometers would be escalatory. Yeah. Now we have moved to 70 kilometers with the high Mars, but we have argued um, partially that we shouldn't go to 300 kilometers because this would be escalatory. But now we sort of know that the range will not d dictate, you know, changing by a few kilometers will not dictate how Russia is going to escalate. If they are going to escalate, there's nothing we can do about that. And it's not our responsibility. And they will probably do it if they ever consider. I think the chances are pretty low. Um, then, it's, um, then it's their own risk that they're taking independent of our calculations. Is It's their escalation. And the MiGs um, are a great example and also a great example of how we're moving into towards that. So a few months ago, it was Poland who said, we will give you our old yeah. mix to Ukraine if you give up, if the United States um, fills up um, the, the log with um, F-16s. The United States has refused. The Slovaks have come out and said the same. Now they're giving them independent of the fact that they remain without air policing and are counting on the checks next door to do it. But there is a bill now um, in the Senate um, from, um, from U.S. senators, bipartisan as well, that is increasing pressure on the administration just from last week to give fighter jets and not Soviet anymore, but, um, but actually um, American fighters, fourth and fifth generation, including the training packages. So we see the same kind of pattern yeah, that yeah. it takes a long time, longer than we should, to actually warm to the fact that um, that we should be giving this, that this is not escalatory, but we can also interpret it, I'm trying to find an explanation for it, where we can also interpret it in a matter of we are we should be going slow so that Russia does not get too scared and they withdraw bits and bits by pieces. Now, I'm not sure that's working and I'm not sure that's cost efficient because the longer we um, we kind of temporize the shipments um, and the flow of weapons, the more it costs us, not just in lives of Ukrainians, but also in terms of just financial cost efficiency and, and how much this war costs the West. If you were writing a six month history of this war going back from February to March, would it, it sound that it'd be, the story would be a, a, about the West too little too late. Is that a fair assessment? So I lost you for most of your question. I said, I said, General, I said, if you were to write a six month history of this war from February till now, you might headline uh, the story of the West too little too late. It seems like that's what you're saying. 
actually, I would start that history several months before the war, because yeah. one of the things we've decided we can't do is help them with placing cap over their country or yeah. putting in air defense. Because yeah. now that Russia is in there and the fight has started, it seems to be escalatory. If we had gone in a month before this war or even two weeks before this war and flown in caps, NATO caps, and established them in the east side of Ukraine, then that would have put the problem on Mr. Putin's back yeah. to attack and, and accelerate the war. And so we, uh, again, the great thinkers of Do that we allow the enemy to take the initiative and we've had right. to react to him so i would have started the the history months before the war started in mm -hmm. our missed opportunities to prevent it well you generally i know that in 2018 you called for shore-based cruise missiles i think in a piece in the london times so long ago i have a question when you left um the the running nato is in 2016 were you in disagreement with Ashton Carter or some of the other thinking that you were taking too aggressive a line with Russia, or was that just a coincidence? Because they came in and then you left shortly thereafter in 2016. So I think that uh, 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 Secretary Ash Carter, who is a dear friend, and, and I agreed on an awful lot of things. But remember that we both worked for President Obama and yeah. President and we both, uh, we both, the mantra, if, yeah. if you remember the mantra of the Obama second term, it yeah. was about closing down wars. He said, I'm yeah. going to close down wars. Yeah. I'm not going to start new wars. So we both uh, had a boss at that time. Yeah. Do you, is it, this is for either one of you. I mean, here, in a way, it's a easier for a dictator to fight a war. I mean, here we have 28 countries in Europe. We have the United States. We have, you know, the, the capitalist countries, industrial countries on the, on the far rim of Asia. It seems like an easier job when you're a dictator. Clearly it is. And uh, Dr. Joja can talk eloquently to this, but I would just say that, that um, uh, we do, we are a nation that pays attention to what our electorate thinks. And yeah. our elected officials are taking cues from that electorate. Jo uh, Dr. Joja? Obama book were that we should be closing down Afghanistan and we should not be starting other wars. So yeah. uh, Dr. Joja, would you like to add? I don't, yeah, again, um, total disagree, uh, total agreement here. The only thing that maybe I would add um, that actually General Breedlove can speak better to, but it's something that I teach at university when we talk about Russia in mm -hmm. European security and the uh, cases of 2008 and 2014, that mm -hmm. through a reform um, in particular in Russia, the um, effectiveness and the fastness of the chain of command has been improved in Russia. So we go through all the shortcomings that Russia had in the Georgia war and in 2014. But unlike in NATO, where we have political control and we have um, over, over the military and we are democracies and we have public opinion and we have free expression and we see all this range of opinions now in this war when it comes to the role of the United States in it and, and what Ukraine should be doing and, and Russia, etc. It's far more complex, it's far harder Whereas in the case of Putin, he just gives the command and then the Duma votes and then the, the militaries move in a matter of hours. We need days and months of discussion and, um, and negotiation to be reaching something that is reflect reflective, as, as General Breedlove says, of public opinion that has its advantages. And we want to keep it that way. We're liberal democracies are proud of that. But it also has disadvantages when we're looking at um, at how effective Putin is in just overnight um, deciding one thing or another. Dr. Joshua, you're a journalist as well as a scholar, and I know you have a pieces coming out in the New York Post. Uh, General, I don't know if you write people up for major newspapers, but I'm curious to get your opinions about how the media has covered this, because if you were 
popped in from planet Mars and watched this war at the beginning, you would have thought that the Russians were just going to be out, out of the game in no time. And we're getting all sorts of information of how many weapons are going into from the West, from the United States, how quickly, what type of weapons, where they're going. What's your view about media coverage and what should be allowed or should not be allowed? Uh, and I'll ask you that question first, General, because Dr. Zuzu, you are the media as well. So we'll let him take a shot at it. Well, I, I think Dr. Joja is really well set up to answer this question, but I want to make an important example, and I hope this internet will bear through this conversation. But um, uh, I was uh, uh, privileged and asked to go to uh, Ukraine just eight days before the war. Just, 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 uh, we'll wait for just, just, eight, just eight days before the war, and then? Uh, we, I was there uh, to, to meet with President Zelensky and others all the way down to the uh, opposing parties in the Rada. And it was two generals and, and about three very, very senior statesmen that were there to have conversations. Yeah. And I must tell you that one of the most important things to your point that President Zelensky pointed out to us was that, you know, you in the West... You ha he not his words, my words. You have been myopically focused on Russia's buildup on our borders. Every day, gasping for air that it's 30 battalion task groups, it's 60 battalion task groups, and your focus has been completely there. He said two things you have not focused on. One, that Russia has been conducting this war for some weeks inside my country sabotage, attacking schools, attacking the transmission all these things and carrying on an intense disinformation campaign. And then third, and what was most striking once the war started, he said, you have not been paying attention to our preparation. That's very interesting. And what we saw was superior uh, preparation for defense in depth, especially around Kyiv, which paid off in the strategic defeat of Russia around Ky around Kyiv. So, so may I just say that we were handed a lesson by President Zelensky in our visit that Western media had taken a completely different tact. And just as you asked in your question, everybody was thinking Russia was going to race to a parade, and Russia thought they were going to race into a parade. And because the world and the world press was not paying attention to these other factors that President Zelensky pointed out. Uh, so, so not high grades for there. Uh, we lost a second, but we had a question that popped in. Well, Luca, I think you have a question uh, coming yeah, in. Yeah, so uh, we, we, we got a, one question from YouTube, actually, from um, um, Madalina Alexandru Kachumaru, who says, what should the West do for the neutral countries so that uh, they will not be convinced out of necessity to join Russia, China, and co? And then uh, Manuela also had a, a question. I will invite her on camera a little bit later to ask the question herself. So I'll take first shot, and then if my internet goes off, Dr. Joja can can finish. Um, uh, so, so yes, what we find so much when it comes to Russia is that Mr. Putin knows that if he can buy time, that people will lose interest in opposing him. Uh, you know, people, the people, hard... people will lose interest in opposing him. And then we lost him. Right. So um, the time for him is a friend because people grow weary of the impact of sanctions on their own country. Uh, they grow weary of the uh, the news that there's other things they want are interested in. And Mr. Putin knows that. And that's one of the reasons why. His, one of his main messages right now is this is going to be a long war. We're prepared for the long term. We're going to stay there until our objectives are accomplished. He's trying to wear us down and accelerate, accelerate this drift from the concern. Um, but I do believe that as people now start to see what is happening in eastern Ukraine, which is very similar to what happened in Bucha, 
this this illegal, immoral, inhumane. In you, but in, as we get in, inhumane, inhumane, yep, immoral, inhumane, illegal, inhumane, immoral warfare. Once people see that is also now happening in the east, just as it did in Bucha, I think this will help to turn. So we need to get the truth of this war onto the streets. General, let me ask you a question there. Do you think the, the Russians have a greater capacity for enduring pain than the West? That in fact, that the sanctions can boom around and hurt us more in our overall efforts than it will hurt the Russians. Of course, they have a closed society. So I, I don't agree totally with the construct there at the end. I think that sanctions are hurting Russia. They are hurting the Russian people. They are hurting uh, Russian economy and, and world view. Changed Mr. Putin's actions. And that's the measure of merit. Where do we get to something that changes Mr. Putin's mac actions? Now, some say that we are approaching that because of the effect of the, of the sanctions, but, but it, has, it has not happened yet. I do not believe that uh, Mr. Putin's Russia has the ability in the long term to stand up to the pressure of this war. But I, I'm afraid that Mr. Putin's ability uh, to withstand the pressure is longer maybe than some of our allies yeah. uh, are, is able. Yeah, well, we saw in Italy, I was in Italy the other day and we saw the government go down. We've seen uh, a very nuanced response from France and, G and Germany sort of dragging their feet a little bit. And, and now uh, talks of uh, a rationing of, uh, of energy to Western Europe uh, to anticipate that for the wintertime. What do you think of that, Dr. Zhuzhu? Will that, will that add up and, and people, they'll cry uncle in the West? Are you concerned about that? So this feeds well into your initial um, question or a bit earlier about media. We already see now for a month or two fatigue in the West with Ukraine. We've seen after a month of the war in 2022, people saying, um, let's end this war. Um, and, and it's hard because wars take a long time, um, particularly this kind of war. And we have given, as General Breedlove was saying, no reason, we have given Putin no reason for him to stop yet. Um, there's a lot we are already doing um, and, and there's a lot more that we can do. And as we're looking at Europe, Europe is in a very difficult situation in which time again, and this has actually happened since November last year, the United States has been touring the world, has been upping mm -hmm. its own production to help Europe out yeah. of the dependence that it itself created. You know, someone recently um, said, I think it was on Twitter, why does Germany have to be in the cold for other Europeans and for sacrifice for, for Ukraine? Yeah. And the answer was because Germany has got, has been getting gas from Satan or from that was the, that was a quote, but but from Russia. And so what, what we know will hurt and is the most difficult part will hurt Russia most is to put right now a price cap on both oil worldwide and as G7 has been talking about at the latest the last meeting, um, but also on gas and with gas just over the last few days it's very unfortunate as soon as um, as uh, Putin blackmailed on Nord Stream 1 with a turbine and with stopping the gas. In that moment, already European consensus was faltering, and we have a meeting tomorrow of the ministers of energy in the European Union, where they have eliminated the possibility of putting a price cap on gas. It's something that um, is kind of a parallel, and with this I'll close, um, it's kind of a parallel between the United States and Europe to different degrees. We don't realize how powerful we are in this relationship. Russia is more dependent on Europe than Europe is now dependent thanks to American help on Russia. If we impose a price cap, there's nothing they can do. If they stop the gas from flowing, they will have more trouble economically than we do. Maybe not in the short term, but in the long term. And they have a history of bluffing. 
it's a problem to find consensus and it's a problem to find the power to realize that deterrence actually works with sanctions and in military terms and that we're a lot more powerful than we actually give ourselves credit for in relationship to Russia and beyond. Right. Going, you mentioned energy there and they were talking about how LNG terminals could be, you know, uh, I guess they're up in, in the northern, near Belgium and maybe along the uh, Benelux area. And also there's coal production in in Poland and Germany, and we have Biden who's just back, President Biden, who's just back from Saudi Arabia. I don't know exactly what that journey, uh, what that, that trip, but what's your feeling about the West's capacity to make up for this shortfall? Is it uh, a little, is it a lot? Is it something that can, uh, will calm, the, calm the, 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 the nerves of the Westerners, West Europeans? I think it's, um, it, it- we don't know exactly because it depends on how much Russia is going to blackmail, how much they're cutting gas. Oil yeah. we've already ma- managed, even with the EU, the United States hadn't had the dependence and they cut it off immediately. The EU has now a plan in place, which is pretty good, in my yeah. opinion, to phase out. So the issue is gas and the issue is in this winter. And it's a matter, I think, of who blinks first. Um, and, and that's what Putin is trying to do. It really depends. I cannot assess this level of flow or um, the lack of supply, the insufficiency in quantitative terms, because I don't think Putin has decided neither how much he's going to bluff and how much he's going to threaten um, to cut off. We have older pipelines that are still working. He can stop the flow there too. We have the newer pipelines um, that Europe is still pretty dependent on. The United States is upping it as much as possible through LNG portals, um, um, uh, ports and through the help that, um, that Europe is getting from Qatar and other countries, but and, and possibly Saudi including with a, putting a price cap on, on Russian oil. That was one of the, the reasons, I think, why President Biden was in, in Saudi. But, um, but, but it's hard for me to assess um, uh, the most likely scenario. I can, at this point, see yeah. the worst case and the best case. Um, and, and the rest is still in Putin's hands, unfortunately. General, I want to go back to a comment you made earlier about how... I think he wanted to uh, make a remark on the energy. Oh, go ahead. Just, go ahead like two, Sorry, two, just two quick remarks. Yeah. One, an important signal now, even though it won't have a short-term impact, but an important signal, I believe, is, is the Western world to commit and start to build the infrastructure that will take time but commit to facilitating the movement of oil from offshore Europe, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, United States and other places, so that Mr. Putin doesn't have this tool. Will not have the effect we need this winter, but we need to send the signal that enough is enough and we are going to invest in what will take us away. And what will, t- and what will take us away? To the winter. And what will take us away? Uh, the second thing, uh, well, if we are we willing to commit to building that infrastructure that will take yeah. us away from this dependency? And then the second short comment, sadly, is if we if we look at the winners of thirteen and fourteen, Mr. Putin waited till the very most vulnerable moment to take his most drastic actions of cutting off fuel, heating oil and other things. And so I think that we will see more bad behavior this winter. Yeah, I think that's a, a safe bet. And you get a little bit, of the, the Russian army to me looks like the Russian hockey team. They have a sort of way of grinding forward like they have now in the Eastern part. They're closer to Russia for supply lines. Um, you have a winter coming on. They're taking people, they're moving them out of the country. They're subjugating the Ukrainian people in terms of their, their role. They, they're Russifying, if you will. Do you think time, because General, you all early on said, I think time's on our side, but I'm gonna ask the other, is time on his side? Is it gonna be difficult to unwind and uh, to reverse as winter approaches, given what you think's on the Western side, the willpower on the Western side? Julie, I think you could do better with that one than me. Okay, Julie, it's to you. Um, so the question is whether how the front is going to go in the next few months. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, that's essentially right. 
Yeah, there's again here, I, I don't have a definite scenario. I think it's important. And it's something that in the last we've been lacking, unfortunately, throughout this war to think in alternative scenarios, plan A and plan B and plan C. What yeah. we know is that Russia has secured the land bridge, the land corridor to Crimea, and they're going to hold on to it as much as they can because they need yeah. to for food, for water, for energy, for everything. Um, and of course, we know that um, Russia is Russia's aim since 2014, it never has really stopped, is to take or destroy all of Ukraine. So they have no incentive to really stop or to let grain flow, as we've seen just a few hours after the grain deal was signed. They bombed um, the Odessa port and beyond. Um, but how much um, how much else damage they can do on the front really depends on the weapons that we are flowing in in my uh, in my opinion that we are flowing in from the west um, into Ukraine. HIMARS with a limited range of 70 kilometers we've seen over the last two weeks just the you know four or now eight pieces are making hu a huge difference. In my opinion, for instance, the grain deal wouldn't have been possible without the HIMARS because we've seen the, the ships um, being moved from Sevastopol in Crimea to Novorossiysk because they were afraid the range was actually 300 apropos deterrence. Yeah. And so if we're giving Ukrainians finally what they're asking for, offensive and defensive because everything is defensive for them particularly fighter jets particularly more air defense with a package that we've seen from biden um, of the 50 plus countries at the end of, of the nato summit that to me if it flows in on time in this fall most of the equipment that is the package so far that can make the biggest difference 500 or 600 pieces of artillery five or 600 um, tanks. That's what the Ukrainians have been begging for day and night um, for the last few months. And I think that can make a difference in actually being able slowly, it will be difficult, counteroffensive is much harder than, um, than defensive to push, um, to push Russians slowly out. But, um, but a lot is still in the cards. And, um, and the last thing I'll say to this, this does not mean that Putin will take decisions that are rational in military terms. Going for Kyiv was not rational, but he did it anyway and he lost. Um, he might try again, he might try to bring Belarus, as I mentioned in the article that I mentioned below uh, before, um, he might try to get or manage actually to get Belarus into the war that will not lead to any significant gains, but in, it can disrupt the, the, the flow of weapons. It can create further migration waves. Putin has been managing to um, weaponize that as well. So there's still a lot in the cards. The one thing we can do to stop this war sooner rather than later is to give Ukrainians the weapons that they need um, to push the Russians out slowly. Well, on that so, note, we've had, I, we have, a, I think the general has to get on his way. He has an, another appointment right. here, about it. but I, I thank you for your very insightful and also historically based. I know you didn't take on uh, uh, Professor Kissinger too heavily there, but I thought you made a very spirited uh, response there. And at the end of a fairly clear laundry list of what, from military terms, the Western side needs to move ahead. So I, I thank you both very much for your contributions. I thought very interesting. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other in, uh, in, in happier circumstances. General, did you want to add something? Well, uh, yeah, I think that the general wanted to, uh, to say a couple of words in closing. And I apologize okay. to everyone. The internet is not with us today, it looks like. Um, and so we didn't really have time for all the questions. But uh, General Breedlove, please, general if you will. Would. Well, first of all, thanks. Apologize for my host's internet crashing and having to use my phone. May I just add that I think one of the most important things we are- One of, one of the most important things, nobody you. One of the most important things in the West we need to do is to decide what we are about in Ukraine. We are not, we said at one time we were gonna give them everything they needed. We are not doing that. We're not giving them enough. We're not giving it to them fast enough. 
And there are still things like coastal defense cruise missiles and medium and high altitude air defenses that we have not delivered on. And so from a policy standpoint in the West, we have to decide what we're about in Ukraine. And then fundamentally, we can begin to adjust the actions that we're taking. Uh, so thank you all for allowing me. Again, I apologize. I no, no. Dr. Jojo was with us to fill in. She's much more uh, intelligent than I. Oh, well, you are fantastic. <laughs> you, you're very generous with each other, but it was a perfectly rounded conversation. Thanks a million for, to both of you. Thank you so much for having us. So long. All the best.